Funding for lawmakers comes from the University of West Georgia in Carrollton, ensuring a better life for Georgians in the 21st century. More than 100 programs of study prepare students for successful careers in the critical professions of education and nursing, as well as business and the liberal arts. The Georgia Chamber of Commerce, the voice of Georgia's business community, over 4,000 members strong, working with lawmakers for over 90 years to make sure that our state remains a place where companies thrive and by supporters of Georgia Public Broadcasting. Thank you. Coming up on Lawmakers, Georgia's $18.6 billion budget for 2010 passes the Senate with some changes. A conference committee is the next step. A bill that restructures Georgia's transportation agencies narrowly passes the House. And a bill that cuts raises for National Board Certified Teachers passes the Senate. Those stories and more are coming up next. Live from Atlanta, this is Lawmakers. Here are your anchors, and Wandy Lawson and David Zelski. And good evening, everyone. On this 39th legislative day, the House remains in session, and the Senate is expected to return from a dinner break shortly. Also on tonight's broadcast, a bill allowing the children of military personnel to transfer into local school passes the House. And the Senate passes a measure allowing for the adoption of embryos. But first, our top story tonight, FY 2010 budget passes the Senate. And the Senate passed its version of the FY 2010 budget this morning, but not without a fight from Senate Democrats over an amendment offered from Senate Democratic leader Robert Brown. This was about taking money from Jekyll Island redevelopment plans and putting them towards the Milledgeville Veterans Domiciliary, which is not funded in the current version of the budget. Senate Appropriations Chairman Jack Hill opens the talks with challenges with the 2010 budget. Make no mistake about it, there are painful cuts in this budget. And as I've talked to you and you've come to me with your concerns, I understand them and I, and I understand there are cut, terrible cuts in here. Uh, and cuts in some areas that haven't been cut before. And uh, all I can tell you is that as we go into conference, we're very cognizant of that. But I have great faith that this state will pull through because of the strength of its people and the strength of its leadership. The leadership of this body and the House, the leadership of the governor and the lieutenant governor, let us never forget that we're all in this together. Are we sending the wrong message to Georgians by saying that we're going to invest $35 million with $25 million. $25 million with a resort investment, yet we can't find a couple of million bucks to house veterans in the domiciliary? This budget is fair and across the board. There are, there are painful cuts everywhere in this budget. And as much as I love veterans, me and you as well, being a veteran, uh, you know, veterans have to step up and take a hit as well if everybody else is taking a hit. And the Brown Amendment failed 21 to 31, and the overall budget passed 52 to 3. So the final changes to HB 119 will now be hammered out in conference committee. And over in the House, questions about how that conference committee work will proceed. Representative David Lucas asked House Speaker Glenn Richardson whether it would be likely that the budget would be ready on Friday, drawing this response from the Speaker. Once we adjourn in about an hour, uh, the, uh, Mr. Harbin, are y'all talking to the Senate at all informally? A little bit. When do you expect, huh? All right, are you going to be, you think we're going to have a budget tomorrow night? The, the point at which it will be almost impossible starts early Friday morning. Are they aware of that? And back over in the Senate, a bill that reduces salary increases for nationally certified teachers passed the Senate today after a successful reconsideration vote. Budget concerns led Governor Purdue and Senate Education and Youth Chairman Dan Weber to push this bill through, saying this certified teacher program doesn't prove to deliver results. Senate Democrats strongly disagree. Senator Weber begins. This vote with the amendment that we have would be consistent with the budget that we passed earlier today. Uh, it gives these teachers $7 million instead of the $12 million. Their governor has said that he will use a line item veto. Uh, if you want him to get $0, vote no. Uh, I have reason to believe that Page, while they don't like this bill, they're sort of okay with it. 
why would it be a problem for us to get more teachers nationally certified in this excellent program? Isn't that good for Georgia school children? Senator, your question presumes that it's an excellent program that's yielding results, and there's been research that shows that it's not, and uh, there's been some research that the proponents of board certification says that it does, and that's still an open question. The Congress asked the American Academy of Science to do research and they stated that this was the best staff development tool in the nation. So if you really care about kids, if you really care about them, you ought to look at this and hear the statistics I just gave you. Again, HB 243 ended up passing 31 to 23 by substitute, so it goes back to the House. Well, the House today gave passage to a measure intended to make it easier for the children of military personnel to enroll in school. Representative Richard Smith explained to Representative Tommy Benton that Senate Bill 114 sometimes exempts these students from end of course and high school graduation tests. Students shall be allowed to continue their enrollment at grade level regardless of age. They shall be placed in the same grade level and also programs as it were from descending school. Um, and they facilitate on-time graduation. I received an email this morning from someone in the Muscogee County School District saying there are cases where military kids have passed a graduation test in uh, the descending school system, but yet when they got to Georgia, they failed the test. Uh, this could be attributed to the fact that uh, their curriculums are different from the different uh, school systems. Now, a similar measure passed the General Assembly last year, but was vetoed by the governor. SB 114 passed 163 to 1 and now requires the governor's signature. The House also debated a measure to allow the creation of special districts to complete school building projects, but has yet to vote on that measure. Representative Ed Setzler presented SR 153. We're talking about public schools um, and only public schools. Um, and we're talking about a district that the voters within the district would choose if they needed additional educational infrastructure within said district, could choose by, by referendum and by the unanimous consent of those members of the legislature that support that district, um, could, put a, could put a proposition on the ballot to tax additional millage um, that is not affected by that constitutional cap, correct? Just like I, I, would, I would offer the gentleman, the constitutional cap for millage to support operations does not affect bonded indebtedness or does not affect um, a sales tax splos that many of us have in our districts with respect to building capital. So and by a vote of 108 to 52, the House decided to lay that measure on the table and at this hour it has not been revived for a vote. Well, other than the budget, the other dominant issue under the Gold Dome this session has undoubtedly been transportation. Today, the House considered its version of the governor's plan to restructure Georgia's transportation agencies. Lawmakers Valerie Edwards has been covering transportation all session long. Valerie, what happened today? Indeed, and Wandy, thank you very much. Senate Bill 200 is perhaps best known as legislation backed by the governor, which would have created a new state transportation authority. When the governor unveiled the measure, he conditioned signing any new transportation funding on getting SB 200. Well, the House amended the bill, taking out some of what the governor wanted, including creating that new transportation agency and selection of DOT board members. One thing which remained intact, the $2 billion plus DOT budget becomes subject to the appropriations process. One of the most hotly debated provisions of SB 200 requires the DOT to run its construction projects list by the governor for his approval. This is the most ridiculous thing I've ever seen in my life. I know somebody's going to tell us in a few minutes this is April Fool's Day. <laughs> and nobody in here would vote for this unless they're a fool on April Fool. This is not a governance bill. This is the governor's bill. This substitute is worse than the original bill that was introduced because this destroys the Department of Transportation by turning it into a mega bureaucracy. But then you've got two groups you've got to be concerned about. You've got to appease the man on the second floor and you've got to appease the leadership of both chambers. Whether you've been here for a year or 31 years, you've all seen enough of the political process to know that there is absolutely no doubt that this consolidation in power over the, G over the Georgia Department of Transportation and how it spends its money is going to be rife with political abuse.
And so it went on for approximately 15 minutes as one by one House members opposing the measure took the well and we heard words like power grab, problematic and incompatible. And then it was time to hear from supporters of the measure. The power of appropriation is the most powerful means of taking care of something there is. This body in the Georgia Constitution has the ability to appropriate revenue. And that body over there wants it so bad, they'd love for us to rewrite the Constitution. But we're not. But the one thing we do not have the power to appropriate is the billions of dollars in this state that gets to be put on the roads of this state for our citizens to travel on. And who do you think they call when they have a problem with their roads? The bill was one vote shy of the needed constitutional majority, leaving Speaker Richardson to cast the tie-breaking vote. The House vote today on Senate Bill 200 was 90 to 84. Changes in the House version sends SB 200 back to the Senate, but we've been informed that at this hour, a conference committee is meeting right now to hammer out the final details in Wandy. Well, I guess we'll find out by Friday what they decide. Yes, indeed. All right, thanks for that report, Thank Valerie. Well, one of last year's key issues was water management and creating new reservoirs in Georgia. However, part two of the reservoir initiative, HB 406, hit a speed bump today in the Senate. Senate Natural Resource and Environment Chair Ross Tolleson explains the role of this bill and is followed by Senator Kasim Reed, who offers an amendment that aims to protect certain Metro Atlanta water sources. This bill just allows for a regional reservoir to be built and that way uh, it won't interfere with the, will not interfere with the uh, service delivery agreements. Uh, service delivery agreements are not something that are rigid and frozen uh, forever. Those are things that can change. And as we uh, look at the northern half of this state especially, and all the water challenges uh, that the city of Atlanta has and other areas in this region, uh, we're gonna need to build reservoirs that are gonna across uh, some service delivery regions as far as delivering water. I know that Atlanta has a tough time in the legislature oftentimes, but on the issue of cleaning up our water and not polluting our downstream neighbors, we have really turned the page in the last four years with the help of this body on stopping that bad behavior that hurt our neighbors. Please don't pass this legislation without amendment number two uh, which will allow us to continue to invest uh, in this system and keep us from polluting our downstream neighbors. We have no problems with reservoirs. I supported the legislation regarding reservoirs, but this specific reservoir will damage the city of Atlanta's um, sewer, water and sewer initiative and place our downstream partners in jeopardy. Mr. President, is it not true that a vote against HB 406 will allow Atlanta to continue to keep its water clean and avoid damaging our downstream neighbor's water? Other senators would probably say we want to capture more water on Georgia soil instead of letting it go to Alabama and Florida to feed the mussels. And the Reed Amendment failed 25 to 29, but as you just saw, House Bill 406 also failed 28 to 26, not receiving the majority vote needed. The Senate then voted to reconsider their action, so with another legislative day left, final passage of HB 406 remains a possibility. Well, the House today agrees to notify the victims of crimes when the perpetrator is released, even when that perpetrator is a juvenile. Representative Donna Sheldon said that SB 246 was inspired by one of her constituents. This bill came about because one of my constituents, um, whose teenage daughter was at home alone, um, had a stalker came to her house, and it was a young juvenile, had a knife, broke in the house, and her dad was able to get there and the police, and they came and arrested this juvenile, locked him up for 90 days, and um, he was released from YDC, and after he was released, within eight hours, he was back at this my constituent's home, this young girl, with a gun. SB 246 passed without opposition. Changes made by the House send that measure back to the Senate. The House also voted to make juvenile court deprivation cases open to the public. Representative Matt Ramsey presented SB 207. We read about a case over in Augusta that there was this little girl 
who had been abused. And the case, uh, and, and, the, and the child advocate recommended to DFACS and the judge not to allow uh, this, this child to be sent back to their family. They heard from their, their extended family. They heard from members of the community, do not send this child back to their home because there's going to be, uh, there's going to be more abuse. Well, the judge ignored the advice of the child advocate, ignored the advice of the community. The, ju the, the DFACS worker ignored the advice of the, of, of, of the child advocate, ignored the advice of the community. They sent the child back to, uh, back to the home and the child was almost beaten to death. SB 207 passed 152 to 10. Changes made in committee by the House send that bill back to the Senate as well. Legislation dealing with the definition and redevelopment powers of tax allocation districts passed the Senate today. However, this local redevelopment tool known as TADS came under fire from several senators who were confused by the definition of blight being used within the bill and whether HB 63 expands the powers of eminent domain. Senator Don Balfour answers a few questions from Senators Jeff Chapman and Vincent Fort. Is it fair to say that the local government and initiating a TAD and supporting a TAD okay. would be in a position to use the power of eminent domain having this definition of blight? No, because this definition of blight has to do with deciding what a TAD is. There's a definition of, of, I keep on using the wrong term, there's a definition of blight that has to do with eminent domain, and, and to be honest with you, I wish they used a different word besides blighted and stressed areas, but they used a, a similar word. There are two definitions, but they have to do with two different things. This definition has to do with defining what a TAD is. That definition has to do with deciding if you can eminent domain a piece of property or not. Couldn't it be true that this definition would cover areas in the city that we would at first glance not consider to be blighted? If you're talking about the city of Atlanta, the city would have to agree to that, and the school system would have to agree with that. If we're talking about a county, the county school system, you still have to get the approval of both the city government, if the city, the county government, if it's county, and the school system's government to agree to do it anyhow. And after several amendments attempting to gut this bill failed, HB 63 ended up passing 48 to 6 and now goes back to the House for their approval. Well, the Senate passed a bill this afternoon that would allow the adoption of embryos in Georgia. Lawmakers Brittany Evans has the details. With a vote of 45 to 9, the Option of Adoption Act sailed through the Senate. Today on the floor, the bill's Senate sponsor, David Schaefer, explained HB 388. Georgia state law actually does not recognize the adoption of embryos. In fact, under Georgia state law, you, a mother cannot give up her child for adoption until after that child has been born. What this bill will do is create a procedure uh, for adopting embryos so that the biological and adoptive parents will have certainty as to the parentage of that uh, child and, and give certainty to the families and to the children as well. Senator Seth Harp also spoke out in support of the bill. It's been a long time coming, but we are gradually evolving and forming some law in this very sensitive area of uh, in vitro fertilization and all of the other areas in there. Uh, I think this is a step in the right direction. The bill received criticism in the House with members saying that there was no need for the procedure, but no one spoke in opposition in the Senate well. Again, HB 388 passed the Senate by committee substitute with a vote of 45 to 9. It now goes back to the House. Reporting for lawmakers, I'm Brittany Evans. And the perennial debate that pits the State Garden Club against those who want to clear-cut trees around billboards ended today with the House voting down Senate Bill 164. When we allow the, the trimming and when we allow this new process, jobs, taxes, sales taxes on the material, income taxes to the, the citizens and the workers pay, a benefit to our communities as we draw in right now in this, in this time that we're going through from a, a very stressful time in our economy, bring in folks off the, off the interstates, off the byways to come in and do business with our local folks. 
Let me just say to you, as a good State Farm agent, I like billboards because my face is on one. Uh, but the fact of the matter is we should not allow uh, the right-of-ways that, that are owned by the citizens of this state to be entered upon and our trees cut away because that is not what we need in our state. And of course, Representative Carolyn Hughley. The House defeated that measure 74 to 89. A motion to reconsider Senate Bill 164 was also defeated. Legislation that would require the Department of Transportation to verify the legal residency status of their employees before providing funding for local assistance road programs ended up passing the Senate today. And lawmakers Tiana Fernandez joins us live with the details on that. Tiana. Thank you, David. Senator Chip Rogers, Senate sponsor for House Bill 2, described this bill as a cleanup law to the Georgia Security and Immigration Compliance Act, which passed in 2006. While HB 2 works on enforcing this previous legislation, several senators stood in opposition to another section of the bill relating to county jails. You're going to require the jailers to determine the nationality of every inmate in a city or county jail in the state of Georgia, no matter what the crime or the amount of time in which they're determined. Senator George Hooks spoke against the bill and questioned Senator Rogers to make sure he had a clear understanding of what the bill was requiring from local jailers. Senator Chip Rogers responded by explaining the reasoning behind this portion of the bill. That, that's not me doing that. Actually, is a 1967 treaty that the United States entered to. It's uh, Article 36 of the Vienna Convention on Consular Relations, which, are, which already requires us to do so. So this is a practice that we're already work, required to do. After Senator Rogers' explanation, Senator Nan Oreck expressed her concern with his reasoning. Should we be putting this law on the books, on the claim that it's tied to the Vienna Convention on Consular Relations when that's not U.S. law. And that's your argument, is it not, for putting this on the books? Senator Jack Murphy ended the debate by explaining what he believed was the real purpose behind the bill. This bill helps the law enforcement agencies and helps the municipalities and, and helps us to get them to move forward on laws that we've already passed. And the bill passed with a close vote of 30 to 17 by committee substitute and will now move back to the House. Reporting live, I'm Tiana Fernandez for Lawmakers. Thanks so much, Tiana. This week, Senate Bill 151 passed the House, and once signed by the governor, it will give victims more ways to provide an impact statement during a sentencing hearing. Lawmakers Emily Banks spoke with the supporters of that bill today. When Judge Roland Barnes was murdered in the 2005 Fulton County Courthouse shooting, his wife Claudia Barnes testified during Brian Nichols' sentencing hearing. She had to provide a written copy of her statement beforehand and was prohibited from showing any emotion during her testimony. Claudia Barnes talks about her experience. This is the, probably the worst thing anyone could ever go through in their entire life. And to not be able to show any emotion at all is just ridiculous that we can't. I mean, it's just... it's. For your spouse or, or your child, no matter who it is, to be uh, murdered, just and it's not like they've been sick and they're going to get well. You know, they're just not here anymore. And to not be able to say anything that would bring about any emotion is just not plausible. Most significantly, Senate Bill 151 would allow for victims to offer a pre-recorded audio or video statement. Supporters, including Wayne and Linda Brown, whose daughter was murdered, say this will help crime victims exercise their right to be heard. Victims, when they're murdered, they are silenced. But as her parents, as my, our daughter Lori Brown, as her parents, we have tried not to let that happen. And this won't help us, but it will help the others that follow in our footsteps. Supporters and other family members of murder victims thank the General Assembly today for the bill's successful passage. Reporting for Lawmakers, I'm Emily Banks. Senate Bill 151 passed both the Senate and the House overwhelmingly and now goes to the governor. State Insurance Commissioner John Oxendine expressed concern today over the proposed elimination of funding for his agency's Consumer Services Division in the 2010 state budget. Commissioner Oxendine explains why he objects to transferring funding to the Governor's Office of Consumer Affairs. However, that agency does not have expertise with insurance problems. They also do not have the legal authority to address insurance problems. Only the insurance commissioner under the code, under, title, under the state law, can enforce the insurance code. The person that tries to help the consumer needs to be the person with the legal authority to remedy problems. 
I, I believe politics is involved. There's no uh, question that the lieutenant governor is running for governor, uh, as am I and some others. And I think it's quite obvious that it is politics on the part of Mr. Cagle. The FY 2010 budget will now go to a House Senate conference committee, as you saw earlier in the program. And Commissioner Oxendine said he hopes the issue will get due consideration. Legislators and activists raised awareness for cancer at the Capitol today. Evan Seitz has that story. In the year 2000, the Georgia Cancer Coalition created an optional checkoff box on income tax forms dedicated to giving citizens the opportunity to donate towards the prevention and research of breast, prostate, and ovarian cancer. William Todd, president and CEO of GCC, commented on those who have helped out over the years. About 500,000 Georgians are cancer survivors, and they're proud of it. We're making great progress, and we'll continue thanks to the generosity of these Georgians. Senators George Hooks and Jack Murphy also attended the conference. My wife lost a battle, a six-year battle, with cancer, and we're grateful for all of you that have been involved in this and you have our undying support. I lost my wife in 2007. The only way that we're going to beat this dreaded disease is programs like this. The coalition has also stated that by 2010, their fund plans to support all kinds of cancer. Reporting for lawmakers, I'm Evan Seitz. And SB 201 passed the House without opposition earlier today, allowing for voluntary contributions through individual tax returns for cancer research. And in transportation-related news, scooter, commu scooter commuters excuse me, zoomed by the Capitol today. Lawmakers Brittany Evans has that story. Through the streets of Atlanta, they roared, representing the state's fast-growing trend of alternative transportation. Bob Dallas, director of the governor's office of highway safety, spoke on the trend and the need for scooter awareness. The legislature today is debating transportation in Georgia, the cost of transportation, the management of transportation. Well, ladies and gentlemen of Georgia, this is part of the answer to that question, and that is alternative forms of transportation. Scooterist Tyler Walton says there's really not much difference between a car and his Vespa. I can do basically everything that anybody else could do in their car, with the exception of pick up lumber, of course. Legislators came out for the event, including Representative Keith Hurd. Zero emissions, huh? With more and more scooters on Georgia's roads, the governor's office of highway safety say safety and awareness are all the more important for car drivers and scooterists. Reporting for lawmakers, I'm Brittany Evans. And just as a reminder, the final legislative day for the 2009 session of the Georgia General Assembly is this Friday, April 3rd. We hope you will join us. Lawmakers, Friday at 7 p.m. for our regular program and also at 11 p.m. for our Signy Die special. And because the General Assembly is in recess tomorrow, Lawmakers returns for our last program this season on Friday again, April 3rd at 7 p.m. And if you have missed any part of this Lawmakers broadcast, tune in tomorrow morning at 5.30 a.m. when Lawmakers repeats here on GPB television. You can also see this episode of Lawmakers at 7 a.m. on GPB Knowledge. And keep up with all of the action under the Gold Dome Daily on your local GPB radio station during Morning Edition, All Things Considered, and Georgia Gazette. Well, coming up on GPB Television, Georgia Traveler. Tonight's episode features the seven natural wonders of Georgia. If you don't know what they are, you ought to watch it. Georgia mm. Traveler is next <laughs> here on GPB. That's our broadcast for this, the 39th legislative day of the 2009 uh, session of the Georgia General Assembly. I'm in Wandy Lawson. And I'm David Zelsky. Join us Friday night at 7 p.m. for the next Lawmakers. Have a great evening. We're we'll now leave you. Leave you. Yeah. yeah, I'm sorry. With <laughs> some additional footage from the House. I believe they've just adjourned for the evening. We'll see you on Friday. Production of Georgia Public Broadcasting.